So we did that back to back. And that was, that was, uh, that was where I kind of like got the feeling like, oh, like this has been really, really successful. Like this is really kind of like crossed the line that hasn't been crossed before for a non Asian artist in, in Japan. Mm. And the best thing that really kind of happened for me that, uh, that really made it, uh, real was that something people don't really know about me is, um, how many things I've done for the process of getting to Japan. So like I said, um, Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to another episode of The Melanated Files. My name is Ranzo and today we're joined by Chris Hart, right? Chris is an American-born Japanese J-pop singer residing in Japan. And today we're going to hear about Chris' story. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. How's it going? It's going good, right? I want you to introduce yourself to the world. Tell them who you are and why you came yeah, to Japan. Um, and you know that good stuff. <laughs> the introduction pretty much covered it. But yeah, I am uh, Chris Hart. I am a singer, songwriter, and producer in Japan. Um, I have been in Japan for about 12 years. Uh, I came uh, after doing a two-week uh, homestay when I was like in my teens. And uh, I started to... Uh, really like uh, like Japanese music and living in Japan. So I just kind of followed that path until I was 25, came to Japan, uh, worked for a little bit, and then was on a TV show that kind of kicked me off and got me into being a professional uh, artist out here in Japan, which I've been doing for yeah. almost about 10 years now. Yeah, honestly, like when you started, when I saw your profile on Instagram and I started doing the research, I'm like, snap, you got a really fascinating story. Like, I'm amazed, I'm blown away, right? So congrats, congrats, congrats. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so tell me how it all began, because you fell in love with Japan from, like, age 12. So yeah, tell me about yeah. that whole story. Um, so what had happened was uh, when I was going to school uh, in the States, I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, it was kind of a very rare thing at the time, but there was a Japanese uh, language program at my school. And um, I really took to studying the language. Um, I liked it a lot. And the teacher that I had at the time had noticed that and suggested to my mother that I do a home state program. So uh, that was the summer of, I think, my eighth grade uh, year. And uh, I did a two-week homestay, and I just loved the experience. It was just very natural. It felt very nice. And um, I was just kind of addicted to the idea of, like, living in Japan. That was, like, really all the way to it. I just wanted to get back. And that became the goal for about, like, the next 10 years of my life was just getting back there and uh, doing whatever work I could to get back there. And through that time, for the sake of my study, I had um, watched a TV program that was uh, broadcast in the Bay Area for um, for Japanese, uh, you know, uh, people in the Bay Area. There was a, a network that uh, played, the, you know, TV shows and music shows. And I just happened to catch one of the music shows one day. And I just mm -hmm. fell in love with the music. And uh, it kind of became like a two-pronged thing where I was just doing Japanese music in the States with my friends, uh, you know, doing that as a, as a part-time kind of... Uh, professional music thing where I perform in Japanese. I did that for like seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, by way of a, uh, by way of, uh, of life's, you know, kind of a crazy adventure. After all the 10 years of just doing random work, I had uh, had enough to kind of get a, a visa in Japan uh, with a company that was doing uh, vending machines. Okay. And, uh, that was, that was my way into living in Japan. <laughs> Okay, nice. So tell me about that vending machine job, right? Because like vending machines are sort of like ubiquitous across Japan and it's like a signature of Japan. What was that like? Yeah. What did you do with the vending machines? Yeah, that was a weird one. So um, my mother had worked for a company that was uh, in the States and they do these ven uh, vending machines that are in a lot of like airports and they mm -hmm. basically sell anything. So they'll sell you skincare products, uh, electronics, anything like that. And they had just happened to uh, decide to open up an operation in Japan. And they were looking for someone to go to Japan and kind of lead that operation. And uh, I was just by fate at the exact same time thinking like, I need to get to Japan one way or another. Like, this is like my chance. I need to just go. And when I heard that, that conversation, I, I went, I interviewed, uh, they hired me. And then when I got to Japan, this was like a bare bones operation. Like it was basically, it was me and then a bunch of machines. And I would just have to go around the country installing these machines, servicing these machines. And uh, it was a very strange experience because I had studied Japanese, but I didn't really feel confident in the ability to use it as much as I needed to. 
Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of like kind of survival mode stuff. We were just learning a lot of the business Japanese uh, on the job. And that was very interesting to have to go around the country and experience not only Japanese business culture, but the various cultures of Japan based on area and how they think about, you know, how businesses should be. So it was a really crazy experience, but it was,、uh, it was beneficial. Okay, so how long did, did you do that for?、Um, I did that for, that would have been three or four years. I think three years. Okay, three it years sounds like then, fun to me, know, though. <laughs> what was that? It sounds like fun to me. I don't、well, know. It, it was, sounds it really was, interesting. It was, it was a lot of fun. So that was, that's the thing that I think I, I was lucky to have that experience because、um, I know a lot of other people end up being like English teachers, and that's an incredibly cool experience to have. What was unique about my experience was that I wasn't. I was based in Tokyo, but my job made me go around the entire country all the time. So I was always jumping on a plane or you know, a bullet train to go someplace to experience someplace new. So I got to really、uh, see all of Japan through that job. And that was a very cool thing to do. And it was,、uh, it's hard because、uh, Japanese culture is you know, a little more strict about how, how things should be done. So they're very、mm. precise. So like a machine has to be placed at precisely this place. And if it's like three centimeters off, they want you to fix it. <laughs> And、wow. they don't want you to ever work during business hours. So I had to go from like、uh, working at 5 a.m. to, you know, to service a machine before the, you know, the stores opened. Or you know, when we're doing installations, I would start at like midnight and then work until five in the morning. And then you know, by way of you know, regular business kind of、uh, flow, go from like the installation back to the office, work a full day. And like, it was just these long, like, over, you know,、uh, overtime kind of days, <laughs> just nonstop. Okay. But it was, it was、so、cool. You- So, I think yeah, Japanese grew, right? I guess it grew a lot. Yeah. That so, time. Yeah. My experience was that, because、um, this was back in 2009 or so. So, this was like, you know, before smartphones, before, you know, Instagram and TikTok and stuff like that. There was no community to come to. So,、um, mm-hmm. all of my interactions were in Japanese. I, I rarely had a chance to use English. There w a s only a few people in the company that I, you know, that I could speak with in,、uh, in English in the office. But then when you go outside, everything was Japanese. So I really had to improve like fast. And then because I only spoke Japanese, I really actually kind of lost the sense to use English. And I never really had like the ability to kind of like turn the two into like a connected thing. Like I can't、okay. translate for my life. Like it's, it's really not <laughs> because I know Japanese and I know English, but I don't link them together. So it's, a, it's、mm-hmm. a kind of a strange situation to be in. Yeah, that's really fascinating, right? Because when I try to get like, people to translate different things, it's like some people can translate from Japanese to English and vice versa,、yeah. and some can't. It's like it's one or the other. I'm just like, huh? Yeah, well, I but think, I get it now. I, I get it now. I think, yeah, I think if, if you learned Japanese in English, you know, by, by having English books that teach you Japanese, you're、yeah. probably thinking from that perspective, like, this means this in English. But when you learn in Japanese, like how a baby would, like, you know that language. In that language, and you don't really have the exact concepts to link them. So,、yeah. like, there are words that I would never be able to find the exact translation for in Japanese because even if there's a close word in English, the nuance of it is totally different. And what it means、okay. to people in Japanese is very different. So, it's just, I gave up. <laughs> I didn't even try anymore. <laughs> like, it's just Japanese, Japanese, English is English. Okay, so tell me about the transition, right, from the vending machine job to、yeah. actually becoming a full time professional singer. Yeah, that was sudden.、Um, I had, like I said,、um, back in the States, I had done、uh, music for, for years. So I'd been in bands and I'd been opening act for,、uh, for Japanese bands that came to the States.、Okay. So、uh, music was the constant. And then when I came to Japan and I was doing the vending machine job, I was still doing music on the side, you know, doing live shows and performances and like commercial work and stuff like that. But、um, I had just by way of just、uh, trying to practice, I put some stuff up on YouTube. This is like before YouTubers were a thing, but just put music up. And、um, a TV show had contacted me、uh, to see if I would be on their TV show to sing some you know, Japanese classics. And I did that. And a producer contacted me after the show. And、uh, he introduced me to the label and, and my management at the time. And、uh, it went from being you know, part time musician, part time, you know, or full time vending machine technician to. Okay, this is going to be full time music now. So sink or swim kind of thing, you know?、Yeah. And that was, that was, it was very sudden. I think the entire thing was,、uh, the f- it was 2012, actually, was when I was on the、mm-hmm. show. And then I debuted in 2013. Okay, so you won that show, right? I, I won, but I honestly didn't even know it was a competition. <laughs> I okay. Didn't, I didn't really know. 
because they just contacted me and said, we just want you to sing these songs. And, you know, they kind of explained that it was like a competition, but there's really nothing you win. Like, you don't win a record deal. Like, it's just, mm-hmm. yeah, you got to the end. So the first okay. time I won, and then I came on the second time, and uh, that was uh, fall of 2012. And I did not win that time, but what happened was I sang the song uh, called Home, which mm-hmm. became my debut single. Um, and when I sang that on the show, it just shot up like to, to number one and all on all the charts. So that was kind of the thing that like got the label like, oh, let's go with this guy. So that was kind of okay, that, okay. That was the point there. Okay, so how did the Japanese populace respond to your debut single? Um, yeah, so we uh, this was 2013 in May. Um, I dropped the single, and then the album came out the following month, and that was. Um, we decided to go with the cover album because it was kind of like a, an introduction to show what I loved about Japanese music. It was kind of like showing my history and the things that I really enjoyed. And uh, that one went platinum, I think. So that was, um, yeah, it was it was a very positive response. It was, uh, it okay. was actually very sudden. Uh, it was more than I expected. It was what I knew I wanted to accomplish because, you know, mm-hmm. if you're going to do music, it's a very risky thing. Like if you're not successful, you kind of like ruin a lot of your ability to just go back to a regular life. So you have to kind of like focus on on getting as much success as possible, and it exceeded all my expectations. Uh, the album went platinum. We um, then uh, followed it up with a single that I did with uh, the legend uh, Seiko Matsuda. So. <laughs> Was huge and then uh because of her i was able to be on the uh the annual music show kohaku so okay. it was it was rapid it was like it was within a, a six month span that i went from like really within that that first year the entire thing was like i i was on the show i won i came on again i did a song and it shot up to number one i did a a concert that sold out twice uh, that in that in that uh, winter of that year, and then we got to my single and my album. It went platinum. I did the single with you know with Matsuda, and then and then that was a, was a success. And then uh, it was just awards and and all this other stuff. It was crazy. It was insane to be so positively received by everybody. Wow. So how did you feel in that moment when like maybe at the end of the first year? Like how did you feel? Right. I never processed it. <laughs> and honestly, it was a lot because. Um, Practically speaking, like when you think about um, about the music business and like people think about like the success of it all, it's a mm-hmm. very, very risky and difficult transition. So like I went from having a very nice, uh, you know, stable career to then not being able to do that career anymore because of the, you know, response of, of the TV stuff. So I went mm-hmm. from like, you know, having having a set amount of money every month to just being at zero and then waiting for my debut. So it was about a year mm-hmm. that we was just kind of living off savings and just trying to survive. And then okay. we debuted and you know you don't really see the fruits of your labor for a long time so it was just like a big thing where like you see i'm getting all this response from everybody and i'm getting all these uh, you know these great uh, opportunities but it's hard to know if that's ever going to link to anything it's hard to know if that's just a one-off like it was it was a lot to process in in one year it was very very okay rapid. okay tell us about your song i love you i heard that on the radio right Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Before. And I'm like, I, I never knew. Right. So tell us yeah, about that, that song. <laughs> that was a weird one. We did that one actually before my debut. So that was actually, um, we made a presentation package for like the industries. We're like, did you just put like some of your, your first like introduction songs? And so it was Home and then I Love You was the first original. And then there were two other covers that we had on it. And uh, that one was like my baby. Like <laughs> we when we made that one, that was like, uh, okay, this is me testing out the waters to see like, what can a non-Japanese artist do in Japan? Mm-hmm. Cause there have been other ones who have been around in like the, in the genres of like Anka or in bands, but there have not been many solo non-Asian artists in, in Japan. And so uh, that one was a strange one for me because we released it and it was a, uh, it was a very like rapid time when we were releasing a lot of stuff and we were doing a lot of tours and stuff like that. And so when we released it, it was mildly successful. It was fine. It was, it was, you know, it was along the lines of what we expected, but um, it was one of those things that, like, for the years after, every now and then you'd hear somebody would be like, oh, I love that song. It was kind of like a sleeper hit in a way, like, you know, only a few people kind of really knew it. And then uh, in 2016 or 17, I decided I was going to take a hiatus. I was going to take a break mm-hmm. uh, to just kind of study more music and do some other stuff. And right during the week when I announced that I was going to take a hiatus, uh, a girl on this on this other show, uh, you know, a similar show to the one that I was on, 
sang I Love You and it blew up. <laughs> okay. And so then it became a song that everybody knew. And uh, that was really, really surreal. <laughs> All right. So tell us about like J-pop. Like, what does it mean to be um, a J-pop artist, or what is J-pop then? Who knows these days? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, when I was into it, when I first got into J-pop, it was just a very, um, it was a unique genre because, like, to compare it to the the time, uh, it was like 1997 or so when I first got into it. And so you take like uh, American pop music of that time, it was like boy bands and rap and and rock, and none of those things really intertwined. But mm -hmm. J-pop was just kind of different. It was like they took uh, they took influences from like uh, European dance music to rock or Latin music. Like they would just merge everything freely. And it was just a very exciting kind of a genre to be involved in. And then uh, there was the rock side where they had like uh, kind of hair metal bands and stuff like that. It was mm -hmm. just very unique and it was very exciting to kind of uh, experience all of that. But uh, when it came to being a J-pop artist, that was very, very different. Like it was just... Um, between the gap between of what I've done with my cover albums and my original songs, there's there's a freedom that I have in J-pop that I don't know I could have experienced anywhere else until mm. maybe recently. Okay. Like recently you'd see you'd see black artists who are able to do pop, they're able to do a little bit of rock and stuff like that. But I mean about 10 years ago, even 10 years ago, like that was still kind of very rare. Like we could only do mm. a few things in in the mainstream of things without being criticized for like not either being black enough or not, you know, or kind of like crossing line that shouldn't be. Now you mm -hmm. got like you know artists who can who can you know they can you know thread that needle. They can kind of go anywhere they want to, and it's it's more acceptable. But when I was starting, yeah, it was you know it was unthinkable that a black artist could do a folk song in an album, then do a rock song, do a pop song, do an R and B song, all in one album, and not be considered like massively other. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been the benefit of J pop is that it's a very fluid, very free kind of a. Uh, genre where you can just kind of take influences from anywhere and in my particular case it allowed me to be the freest artist i could possibly be because there's just no boundaries for me okay so being a j-pop artist in japan like what has that been like right the reception of the japanese populace foreigners that see you on tv and stuff like tell me about that experience i didn't know until i took my hiatus actually because like mm. It was so fast that I didn't, I knew that like by being on Kohaku, that's essentially like the one show, like where everybody watches and everybody knows the people more or less who are on Kohaku. So I knew that like from that point on, people had heard of my name, but I didn't know what that meant. Like, you know, to be known and to be popular, are very different things. So, mm. so I knew I was known, but I didn't really have an, a sense of what that would, uh, what that meant. And then we did, um, we did two back-to-back -back 47 prefecture tours and a Budokan live. So Budokan is the, is the big, you know, 10,000 capacity venue. So we did that back to back. And that was, that was, uh, that was where I kind of like got the feeling like, oh, like this has been really, really successful. Like this is really kind of like crossed the line that hasn't been crossed before for a non Asian artist in, in Japan. Mm. And the best thing that really kind of happened for me that uh, that really made it uh, real was that it's it's kind of a gray line for, for a lot of non-Japanese uh, artists about where you fit in if you're a domestic artist or if you're a foreign artist who's operating in Japan. Mm -hmm. And from the very onset, my label decided that I was going to be a domestic artist, which means I was a Japanese artist, which means I would be, you know, in the category of other, you know, if you, when you're going for awards, you're a Japanese domestic artist, not, you know, the foreign category. And uh, everything along my career has basically been that, where it's just naturally been that I'm a Japanese artist like any other artist in in Japan. And uh, that's a weird thing to say because I'm, you know, like black but Japanese, but like, yeah, in terms of I'm a domestic artist. And that was mm -hmm. a really big uh, confirming point where it was like, oh, this is, I'm being accepted in this community. So that was, that was, that was the, the kind of the point that made it clear to me. Okay. And you also became a Japanese citizen in 2017. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right before I took my hiatus, I was uh, I became a Japanese citizen, so I renounced American citizenship and took only Japanese citizen citizenship. So tell me about tell me about the thought process, like why that transition. Um, it was always in my mind as a possibility that um maybe I would do that because I always wanted to live in Japan and I saw myself staying in Japan for the long term. Um, 
And then the opportunity came up. It was about five years. I was in my fifth year, I guess, fifth or sixth year. Um, oh, no, actually, let me think about this. How long was that? I think I would, this was about, yeah, 2017. So that was actually um, my fifth year on that current visa that I was on. <laughs> Okay. So it was my marriage visa and I was on my fifth year and it was one of those things where I could consider if I was going to do long-term citizenship or long-term residency or citizenship. Yeah. And uh, my son was born at that time and uh, we were expecting my daughter at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was kind of like, it just made sense. Like I'm, I have no real intentions of going back to the States. Um, not for any like, you know, personal reasons at the time. It was just, you know, looking at my future it made sense to put all of my investments personally and, you know, privately and you know, professionally uh, into Japan. And that worked out <laughs> more or less. Okay. Okay. Nice. So, okay. With the recognition that came with, you know, being a J-pop artist, right? Was there any negative aspect of being a J-pop artist in Japan, but being black as well? Um, It's not particularly. So that's kind of the mm. weird thing. Like, um, I would say that I was received positively, uh, openly f uh, for, for what I do. And mm -hmm. being black was rarely ever any uh, negative part of that or any like hindrance to what I was doing. I was, uh, if anything, it kind of had like the, the only thing that it, that it might've had that was so slightly negative was that the assumption was automatically that I was a sole R and B singer. Okay. By just by, by, way, by way of just being black, which is not, it's not a genre I don't do, but it's not the only genre I do. But as I said before, like, even if that was the image, no one ever said to me like, oh, well, you're, you know, you're a black artist, you can't sing a folk song. Like they'd give me a bunch of different, you know, opportunities to sing different songs. So it was never a, a huge negative. Um, mm -hmm. Even running into like massive stereotypes was very rare. There were some times where like they'd ask me to sing songs that were actually like historically problematic. <laughs> and mm -hmm. if I brought that up to them, they'd understand it. We'd have the discussion and they were always very open. Um, I'm very thankful that in my experience, people have been uh, very, very positive and very, very open to, to understanding where I'm coming from and understanding what I want to do. But yeah, if there was any, any kind of like um, potential negative, it's just that the stereotypes that they, that they know kind of stick and getting them beyond those stereotypes is a process, but they've, but they've never been resistant to that. Okay. All right. So when you sing your songs, right? Um, it has been said that you sound you sound very, very Japanese, right? Even your pronunciation, they say. all that. So, so <laughs> yeah. tell us about that. Talk about the, the process of like perfecting the accent and all that. Um, honestly, I don't even know if it's a process as much as it's just time. Mm. Um, for me, singing in Japanese is something I've done since I was like twelve. So, I mean, that's kind of like the ideal times when you're young to kind of get into a language because you start processing those very, very subtle differences in like in, in mm. pronunciation and stuff like that. So I think in my case, it's just time. I started at a young age. It's not something that I, you know, I studied for like five years, something like that. I started when I was, you know, 12 and just kept doing it for so long that I think it just became a natural kind of thing. Um, mm. There are some intricacies that I still don't have. Like there are some really fine points in like Japanese pronunciation that I could probably study to work on, but it's never been a necessity. But um, I think improving is just about committing 100% to the process. And for me, mm -hmm. um, I will say that one of the hard things is that uh, for much of that time between 12 and uh, when I debuted, I think 27, I didn't sing in English that often. I was primarily singing in Japanese, even in my in my oh. music uh, career back in the States. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I realized recently after starting to sing in English again is that you use very different muscles to do that. And switching mm. between the two can be very, very difficult and can start okay. messing with the, the pronunciation of both. So recently wow. I've been very, very like uh, in my head about that kind of stuff because it's a problem that I didn't have before that like now that I'm singing more in English a little bit, uh, it's getting very confusing. <laughs> so, okay, wow. So maybe the fact that I was always operating in Japanese alone was one of the major reasons why that worked out. Okay. Oh, wow. That's interesting. The, the, the switch, right? Different muscles yeah, and all that, right? Yeah, the switch is very, very hard. Is it painful? Is it more painful, like strenuous on your voice or what? what's the, oh, the difference? Japanese like? is way easier. Japanese okay. is way easier to sing. It's a phonetic language, so it's a lot more open. It's a lot easier. I think English mm. is a lot harder because you just have a lot of consonants to kind of worry about and projecting that and not tightening up the throat is just a different process altogether. Okay. Okay, tell us something that we don't know about you, right? So, you know, you've been out there, something that you can share 
that the world doesn't know about you? Something that people don't know about me. I think everything's on my Wikipedia at this point. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> um, something people don't know about me. Something people don't really know about me is um, how many things I have done for the process of getting to Japan. So like I said, um, I, uh, I spent that time from when I was uh, at the homestay until the time when I finally got here, trying to develop 10 years worth of experience of like, you know, anything that would get, you know, Japanese related to kind of help me with a visa uh, when mm-hmm. it came time. And um, alongside that music was one of those things I was like, maybe through music, I can get to Japan. And that was kind of the major motivation for music in the early years. But um, mm-hmm. I did a uh, training for pro wrestling as well. Uh, I worked, uh, I worked for a San Francisco police. I uh, I worked for a skincare company, a Japanese mm-hmm. skincare company in the states. Uh, I worked at an international airport, do a like servicing private jets and stuff like that, and, and sending like celebrities off to their hotels. Like, I did a lot of stuff to try and get to to that point where I could finally like get to Japan and, and do music and stuff like that. Okay. So I think that. Um, if there's anything that people don't know, I think people kind of think there's this image that I just came to Japan, was having fun, got on a TV show, and then debuted, and then everything went great. I have been doing music the entire time. I studied uh, vocals when I got to Japan for about three years, too, uh, with, mm-hmm. with a great teacher. Um, I worked a lot of jobs, long hours, uh, for a long time to get to where I was. So it was like 10 years of just grinding to finally get to that point. Uh, more than 10 years, probably about 15 years in total. So it was uh, it was a lot of work to get there. Wow. So this was your life's goal, right? To get yeah, to Japan, just, just right? Just getting here was, was the thing. And then once I had that, everything else has just been kind of extra. Wow. So you also studied Japanese at university as well? A little bit. So the, what happened was uh, I graduated from high school when I was 16. Mm-hmm. So then I went uh, to study uh, Japanese for about a year and a half, two years before um, like family kind of uh, issues forced me out of college and that was when i had okay. to commit to just doing work to, okay. to get to japan so it wasn't a very long time when i studied japanese uh in college okay so you also had like a, a musical family as well right from what i've read so yeah your parents were, yeah yeah my, my mom and my dad met through music and music was always a part of my uh my upbringing my mother sang in spanish so she sang in salsa bands uh throughout okay. my childhood so she was always uh that was kind of the thing that made it a little bit natural for me is that my mother always sang in Spanish. And for me singing mm-hmm. Japanese, that wasn't totally like uh, a crazy thing. So okay. it was, um, yeah, the music was always there. It was classical, salsa music, uh, jazz, funk, uh, just a lot of music that, uh, that came through our house and kind of like kept me in that, in that set of that mindset for so long. Okay. So it was in your blood. It's in your blood. Right? They say. Oh, no, my, kid, <laughs> my kids are massively into music, too. So maybe it is something. I don't know. All right. All right. Any relation to Kevin Hart? I had to say, I had to ask. No, no, no. But people definitely get that mistaken very, very often uh, in Japan. They're like, whenever they can't remember my name, they're like, Kevin Hart? I'm like, not the same guy. <laughs> yeah. I think because Hart doesn't seem like it's a rare name to me. I don't see it a, a lot. Maybe it's. That's an, why. it's yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's not one of the ones that people would normally associate with black people overall. Okay, probably. it's probably okay. not one of the like one of the key ones that people normally think of. So yeah, okay, <laughs> maybe that's all right. When you took the two year hiatus, right? Uh, yeah, what were you doing during that time? Yeah, so I um we had done that the two forty seven prefecture tours back to back, and that was a forty seven prefecture hall tour. So that was like ninety eight shows in total. Um, mm. every venue was like, uh, between two and f- 2,000 to 5,000 people. Mm. And then sandwiched in between those two tours was the Budokan show, which was about 9,000, 10,000 people. And we did that over the span of like a year and a half. And mm. I was burned out and I developed, um, like ringing in my ears during the okay. end of the, of the second tour. So, um, after speaking with, uh, with a the doctor, they said, you need, you need to relax and rest or it won't get better. And uh, I decided, you know, I'll just I'll just take the time because if it doesn't get better, I need to think of another, you know, another plan and what, uh, like another course. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I decided that I would take time off. Uh, my second child was born at that time, and I studied uh, online uh, via Berkeley, uh, Berkeley Music Online, and I studied mm-hmm. production, songwriting, um, just a bunch of uh, various fields to to kind of get my skills up. Uh, I wrote songs for some some artist um abroad and uh helped like uh, co- uh work with a disney acapella group and stuff like that just random projects in production outside of singing to kind of like mm-hmm. readjust and give myself some new skills 
you know, should anything else ever come up? And spent a lot of time with my kids. <laughs> and that was pretty okay. much the experience. So you're a family man now as well, right? You're married. And how many kids do you have now? I have three kids. So I had another kid in that hiatus. <laughs> it was it was um it was it was what we planned. We wanted to have three three or three or so kids because we thought like having a, a community of of half kids would be better than having them fighting on their own, you know, in a, mm -hmm. in a society that is mostly Japanese. Yeah. So um yeah, it was it was cool. It was um but it's a lot. It's um when I debuted we had no kids and then it was around the midpoint when I started when I had my first kid, my my son. And then right before I went on hiatus, I had my second child. So uh, what I have found from coming back is that being a parent of three and doing this job is extremely difficult. Mm. It is very, very hard because there's a lot of travel. There's a lot of long hours. Um, this time around, I write and produce all the stuff. So it's, it's you know, you're changing diapers and then you're changing tracks. And then, you're, you're, you know, you're spending like a week on, on the road and then you come back and you've got to take the kids to like, you know, special lessons and stuff like that. Like it's a... It is a lot to be a uh, a musician and a full time parent. <laughs> yeah, wow. So tell us about like maybe some more of the intricacies of the experience, right? You and your family, yeah. um, your mixed kids in Japan. Like, what has that been like for you guys? Um, yeah, I mean they're still young. So my oldest is uh, just about to turn six. Um, okay. Yeah, it's uh, they're six, four, almost six, six, four, and two. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to expect right now. I know that I've heard stories of people who are mixed. Uh, who grew up in you know the in the late nineties, early two thousands, and uh, it's I want to say it's changed because there are a lot more black and half black celebrities on TV than there were mm. ten years ago. So um, I don't think it's as rare anymore. Like when I think when people see half black children, I think they're kind of like, oh, I've seen that somewhere before, but I still think they don't get it. And I think there's mm. still that opportunity for a lot of uh, misconceptions and stereotypes and some. Uh, culturally insensitive <laughs> happenings. But mm -hmm. um, as it is right now, uh, my kids' friends are, 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 are great to them. They, you know, there's never anything uh, incredibly like racial about their experience or anything like negative about their experience um, so far. <laughs> I, mean, I guess we'll see mm -hmm. if anything comes up. But uh, I think right now is probably one of the best times because there's so many Olympic athletes representing Japan who are half black. And there are so many, there's, you know, a, half black uh, comedian on tv you know i'm out there. there's a full black uh comedian out as well uh there's just a lot of us actually in media uh and we're all representative in really positive ways like it's it's probably the best representation i can imagine that we've had in a long time mm. and i remember you, uh, you interviewed with uh, dante and it's just mm -hmm. you know another example of like you know we we, we hit the fans sometimes we, we hit some some parts where you know uh where some you know racially questionable stuff happens but uh i think overall japan has kept us in in a very positive light in in the way that we're able to operate mm -hmm. uh and i think anytime that, it, that a, a negative image comes up it's not from us mm. it's from <laughs> so what are you doing now like what's the future like for you what's what are your plans some of your plans for the future what's the future like for anybody at this point <laughs> i mean everything is kind of crazy so like True. i came back in 2020 and uh, we had a the plans to uh, to do a tour and release an album and uh that was all postponed because of the pandemic mm. and then uh yeah i think uh at this point there are no plans i'm just gonna roll with it and just have fun i mean at this point i get to produce my own stuff uh we have another tour planned for uh, april this year mm -hmm. fingers crossed and uh, indeed at this point because it's so uncertain i'm glad that i had taken that time off to kind of um to learn new skills because now you know with this with this time i was able to make an album in, in the time when we couldn't do live shows i'm gonna make another album actually this week <laughs> so okay so um uh right now it's hard to plan anything so the, the goal is just to keep pushing forward try new things try uh new sounds try new uh projects produce some other people and just see what happens at this point um i'm lucky to say that because of i love you and just the, the flow of my career um I don't really have to fight to be known right now. Like I don't have to like fight to have people know my name, which allows mm -hmm. me to kind of relax a little bit and just determine what kind of artist I want to be going forward. So that's kind of a, a bit of a relief for me right now. Okay. Is there anybody that you'd like to work with that like maybe a dream collaboration or, oh, or that something is, like that? That is a hard one. I have worked with a lot of people. <laughs> uh, okay. 
and then not, not not like not like a flex or anything, but I mean, just in terms of like a, the the flow of my career is I've been on TV for so long, and a lot of these shows are collaborative. So I've sung with a lot of incredible people just by by way of luck, and I'm very mm. very thankful for that opportunity because I don't think uh, it's an opportunity many people get to have. Um, I think the only thing I really want to do right now is, if I could, I want to help support newer artists, people who want to come up right now in, in a time when it's really hard to be an artist. Mm. So I think uh, my main focus right now is just finding those new artists who want to have a collaboration, who want to kind of like try something new and get a new project out and see if I can help uh, help people in the way that I was helped when I got started. So any genre? Any genre. I'm, I'm open to anything at this point. There's, okay, I okay. mean that's what i love about it there's no limits on us and i know like i'd never made a major consideration to do music in in the states because i was always singing in japanese and mm -hmm. i still have no major considerations of, about that like it's not something that i long for but um i am very aware that i could not be this artist uh in the states like mm. that's even today it's still it's still hard i love the you, ability that i have to just do whatever i want okay Okay, you mean the genre, right? The genre. Yeah, itself. yeah, genres. Because I mean, there's just there's no limitation for me. Like, I don't have to worry about a label exec exec telling me that I'm I'm meant to be a rapper, mm. or that I can only do rap when I want to when I want to infuse other influences, or like I don't want someone to say that you know because I do rap, therefore that's a negative and I can't do other projects. Like, I love that you know on my last album we had uh, synth pop and we had uh, acoustic songs, we had some rap in there. Like, it was everything. And mm -hmm. that was never a problem because I've established myself as an artist that can do any genre. So I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. So any advice for maybe people in Japan who want to break into the, the music scene here? Any advice that you can run for your lives give them. at this point? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, um, um, that's a hard one. Um, mm. Because I think people's experience and their and their advice is relevant only to what they've experienced themselves, and it's very easy to say like if you do things this way, it'll be a success. But times change. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, at this point, if you have a dream, just go for it, and by whatever methods it takes and whatever uh, whatever you know route you go, make it happen. Because I mean, my debut was not the way I expected it to be. It was just a bunch of odd things that I never imagined that came together. And I think mm -hmm. nowadays people are like you know. If, if you ask some older older producers, they would say, you know, get a good demo CD together and put that together and, you know, pitch to all these labels. But really, I mean, make a good song, put it up on TikTok. I mean, <laughs> do whatever you have to do because um, yeah. there are a lot of possibilities you just can't imagine. And that's that's where chance is, in the places that you don't know. So mm -hmm. just have so it's just, so just going after it, right? That's the yeah, thing. Just, just go after, after it. it. And just be open to, to the possibilities. Okay. What about coming to Japan? Black people that wants to come to Japan, people that are watching this right now, like any advice for them how to yeah. uh, come here and experience life? So even that is one of those things I'm, I'm, I'm careful about giving advice because I only lived a normal life in Japan for three years before I okay. transitioned to, you know, being in, you know, in entertainment. Um, it's obviously not for everybody. I mean, it depends on what your, what your, what your mindset is and what you're looking for. But um, I think Japan is a, a fun place to be. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you can't uh, undercut the safety that you might feel compared to other places where you, you could live. But um, if you're going to come, be open minded and just, you know, embrace the experience. And uh, my personal experience was that uh, I came in and I decided I was going to forget everything that I knew back in the States. I was like, mm -hmm. I just want to learn Japanese life as it is and see how that is. Um, and that made things very easy for me and very, very uh, enjoyable. But, uh, you know, there are problematic parts of any culture and you want to be careful not to, to inherit those parts as well. But um, just just come in with an open mind. See if you like it. See if it fits you. And if it doesn't, there's no harm in that because you experience oh. something and you'll grow from it. Okay. How important do you think the language is? Um, okay. So this is a weird one. Um, being too good is actually a bad thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, being being so this is one of those things about linguistics that I think a lot of people don't think about because when you're in your own country, everyone speaks the language, so you don't think about it. And when you go to another country, then it becomes everything. But I don't mm -hmm. think people are ever really that impressed with people's ability to speak a language. Okay. Because because as a native, everyone can do that. It's not that big a deal. So mm -hmm. like even in the music business, like if you speak really well, or uh, too well rather, 
you know, it's it's kind of like off putting because you're a little bit show offy or, you know, it's really oh. just no one really thinks it's that it's that great compared to like the other skills that you might want to have. Developing yourself as a person is way more important than developing your language skills, because if you have a passion for communication, one way or another, you can communicate, even if it's in broken Japanese or if it's using a translator, people are more responsive to you by your personality than your ability to speak. If you have an, mm. you know, the idea to, to communicate with people, that's enough, I think. Oh, wow. That's, I've never heard that answer before, and it's really profound. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just, it's, it's, I know a lot of people who speak Japanese way better than me. Uh, mm. who have a really hard time because when you think it's a, it's a special, you know, skill and it is, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Uh, natives don't find it that impressive. I think okay. people, natives are more impressed by people who are really trying to get the language down more than they are by people who have it down packed because at that point you're just as special as anybody else. Okay. Anything, What's the best life advice you've received in your life? The best life advice um i don't know if it's the advice i received as much as it's the the knowledge i gained but i think um the best i guess yeah the best advice i i received would be there are two things always burn your bridges and failure is the key to success so burning your bridges is a weird one because i think a lot of people don't like to do this but the goal is not to just burn every bridge you cross but rather if you are leaving a place that was not good for you don't be afraid to let it go because you mm. never want to go back there anyways there's nothing new for you there there's nothing beneficial for you if you go back to a place that was not mm. good for you so burn your bridges <laughs> and then never be afraid to af afraid to fra fail because failure is what makes you grow mm -hmm. failure is like is is you know the fruit of the labor it's everything that allows you to reflect on the things that you've done so you can finally get that success so I think that's a big thing that kind of gets a lot of people when they're trying to achieve a goal is they're just, they're afraid of burning bridges and I think they're afraid of failing, but you cannot get ahead without doing both of those. Oh, wow. So tell me, what do you miss the most about America? Nothing, actually, <laughs> <laughs> other than my family. I mean, this is, no, and this is, I mean, this is not to like, to, to cut down America or anything. I mean, it, it was, you know, it's half my life, but I mean, um, Lately, particularly, like a lot of the things that I would have missed in America, like certain kinds of foods and products, I can get easily in Japan now anyways. Um, the the rhythm of life in, in, in America was never an absolute fit for me. It was never really that comfortable for me. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. comfortable in my rhythm here in Japan. So I can't really say there's anything other than my family that I miss in the States because I, I really enjoy my life here. Um, there's not okay. much I miss. And people said when I naturalized, like, you're going to miss your American passport. And the Japanese passport is actually kind of stronger, so it's there's <laughs> really not much that I'm that I'm that I'm lacking. I mean, I can get anything on online that I need, and uh, I don't I don't think there's anything that I would that I would go back for at this point. Okay, what do you like the most about Japan? Well, just one thing, if you could if you could pick one, one thing, thing that I like about Japan, um, it's it's hard to explain to people because I think it's it's a it's a source of positive and negative things, but mm. I like. I like the the group thought of Japan. Okay. And that's that's a hard one because I, I acknowledge that there's some bad parts to it. But in times of like struggle, because I was here during the 2011, you know, uh, earthquakes and stuff like that. When times get rough, people come together. Okay. And uh, they, they fall in line and they follow the guidelines and they follow the rules. And that can provide for a lot of stability in really hard times. So, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things you can rely on. Even when it's when it's a negative result, you can still rely on the fact that things are going to go in a certain way, and it makes mm -hmm. it easier to kind of plan your life. It's not a very chaotic place, Japan. Um, whether you like it, you love it or hate it, there's just you know a very predictable flow to how things go, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that now more than I did before. Like I appreciate that I can I can navigate my life here with a certain amount of certainty because people don't act out so uh crazy <laughs> you know mm -hmm. you know what I mean. okay what about one pet peeve that you have about japan one pet peeve uh fear of risk mm. um it goes back you know burning your bridges and stuff like that i think the fear of risk in japan uh keeps things from ever progressing in in the best ways to make japan a better place um i think that's changing i think because of the circumstances right now people are, are forced to address risk and uh and uncertainty but um, I think in any in any field, I think people would normally say that uh, 
the the fear of risk and the and the inability to change with the times is what often bothers them. But um, mm. I, th I think that's changing. What's your songwriting process like? Like, what, how would you describe uh, your style? Yeah, um, that's a work in progress now because I'm kind of changing from what I used to do. But um, normally what I'll do is um, I will look for the sounds because I'm kind of from a production mindset more than just the songwriting thing. So I look for the sounds that I want to get, the, the concept that I want to get. And uh, as it is right now with my current project, my wife does the lyrics. Uh, and then I do the I do the music, and then uh, that's uh, that's been a very beneficial kind of project because we have a very different voices and different thoughts about topics, and uh, and coming together to f to find out the common message has been a very fun thing. Okay, so your wife is also a singer as well. Yeah, we met through music. So she uh, she used to be a singer, and now she does uh, all the lyrics for our project, and uh, and it's, it's it's great. Okay, all right. So where can people find you online? Where can they find your music? All that good stuff. Um, to my knowledge, worldwide, I believe all the music is available on all streaming platforms. Um, on Instagram, Chris Hart underscore official and Twitter, uh, Chris Hart underscore JP, I think. But if you just search Chris Hart J pop, I should come up. I mean, that should be there. There's not many of us. <laughs> so. And also, you have a YouTube channel as well, right? A YouTube channel. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Chris Hart, um, yeah, if you search for Chris Hart, uh, I love you, it'll come up. Uh, that's where all my promotional videos have come up. So all the music could be there. All right. Anything else you'd like to share with the world? Like before we go, uh, I know the times are rough. I know people are having a hard time. They're trying to figure out where they want to go and what they want to do in life. And I think uh, as hard as it may be, this is uh, a gold mine of opportunity. Like there's a lot of chance out there. If you're willing to just take a risk and find the things that make you happy. So I hope people do that. Uh, that was exactly what led me to my to where I am now. Uh, every major breakthrough I had was born out of some kind of loss or or difficulty. And uh, once you get used to that, you start finding where the real opportunity lies. And I hope people find that for themselves. All right, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate no, thank it. Thank you. So guys, this was Chris Hart, right? Check out his stuff in the description down below. The links are down there, so go check them out. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. Until next time, thank you so much for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>